Hyatt Saturday, June 29th, still tracking multiple tropical systems in the Atlantic. We have an invest over the Yucatan Peninsula that could become a tropical depression before making a second landfall in Mexico. Incredibly, we have a hurricane, new hurricane barrel, east of the Caribbean in late June. Very uncommon to have something like this going on, but it is on the intensification trend and is moving toward the Windward Islands. So we are going to be seeing hurricane impacts in those islands in a day and a half or two days. And there's another wave behind Barrel, which may develop and encroach on the Caribbean as well, but that's about five days out from the islands and we're dealing with Barrel right now. So we won't be talking too much about that wave in this video. For about one and a half minutes, I do wanna to touch on this invest over Central America really quickly. This is the zoomed in view. We've been talking about this for a while. It's a broad wave envelope. You've got Southerlies here wrapping around towards north northwesterlies over the bay of campeche so we're starting to get a sharper wave axis and maybe the beginnings of a broad closed circulation to form and we might see that over the bay of campeche as this moves out over the water you can see the white clouds here indicating thunderstorms producing heavy rain over central america and southeastern mexico and that will continue to be the case as this moves westward and into the likely veracruz region of eastern mexico where more rain is expected while this could become a tropical depression before landfall, it's unlikely to have enough time to generate significant wind hazards. So this is mostly going to be a rain event regardless of whether it becomes a tropical depression or not. This is a quick look at the GFS in 24 hours on Sunday morning, showing the broad area of low pressure that does form here. That could be a TD. NHC might initiate advisories based on something like that. And same with the European model, a broad but closed circulation does form before landfall and landfall is expected sometime overnight sunday night so again we could get hurricane center advisories on this but primarily a heavy rainfall event for these regions that have already seen a couple of those over the last few weeks so do be careful and watch out for flash flooding hazards there switching back to the wide view we are watching barrel uh, just to give you a another reference here it is moving quickly now 23 miles per hour towards the west is its forward speed and it's moving toward the windward islands this is the zoomed in view as the sun is about to set when i left you 24 hours ago in the last video on friday we talked about how at this moment today we were going to be assessing the inner core structure and whether a compact inner core wind field and convective structure is forming that was going to determine the level of threat to the Lesser Antilles. And unfortunately today we do see an inner core beginning to develop. You'll notice this curved arc of overshooting cloud tops around the southern and southeastern side of the center. The center of the storm is right in that dimple, which may eventually become the eye. We have a formative eye wall that is developing. It's around mostly the western and southern side, and just as the sun sets here, trying to wrap around towards the east side. We got a microwave pass a couple of hours ago, showing that structure nicely with most of the heavy thunderstorms on the south side, and you can see the dimple in there, indicating the formative eye and the half moon eye wall, which hasn't quite closed off on the northern side just yet but it is rotating towards the up shear side there is a little bit of easterly shear still present over the storm that is going to be relaxing over the next day or so but it is causing some of this asymmetry so that's why we're seeing half of an eye wall and the vortex was earlier this morning just a little bit tilted southwestward with height unclear whether that tilt remains now but regardless with this convection starting to rotate towards the up shear side that's a sign that the storm is continuing to intensify and begin to fight off this light easterly shear and the shear is going to disappear over the next 24 hours anyway so conditions are generally favorable and with this structure barrel is likely to continue intensifying it has now attained hurricane intensity with winds of 75 miles per hour we won't get an exact measurement of the strength until the first aircraft reconnaissance aircraft goes in sometime tomorrow morning and we'll get direct readouts of how strong barrel is but we are expecting intensification to continue now that this inner core structure has formed and that's going to matter a lot here as this approaches the islands and including its its track right now the center is right along this 10 north line it is a hair south of where some of the modeling had it which was just a little bit farther to the north and that is splitting hairs a little bit but at this point the storm is compact and so exactly which islands it impacts with the core hurricane wind field uh, that will make a difference uh, 36 to 48 hours down the line 
Here's an example of how big Barrel's wind field is going to be. This is the NOAA HAFS A hurricane model showing Barrel just to the south of Barbados here. This is Tobago on the very south edge, Grenada, the Grenadines, St. Vincent, St. Lucia. And as this comes in, this is a compact system, rather small. Everything in green is tropical storm force wind. You can see it's fatter on the north side. As the storm is moving towards the west, the quote strong side or fat side is going to be to the right of the motion. So we'll get a larger wind field north of the storm track and a less expansive wind field on the south side. The hurricane force wind field is in purple. And you can see that this is pretty small. This could fit entirely within the Grenadines without impacting Grenada or St. Vincent if this particular model forecast were to come to pass with the storm size. Hafs B has a similar core size and you can see that the exact track here of this eye wall, it'll matter a lot for the wind hazards. We are going to get a more expansive area of tropical storm force winds and heavy rainfall that causes flash flooding concerns across most of the Windward Islands. But the true wind threat here is going to be localized to a rather compact hurricane core. And so exactly where this goes, yeah, those details are going to matter. We talked to you a lot about not focusing on the center of the storm track, but in this case, it does matter a whole lot for the wind threat to the islands. Now looking at the GFS upper level environment going into overnight Monday into early Tuesday morning, you'll see that the system crosses over just near St. Vincent on this particular model run. And the upper level flow here is shown with potential vorticity in color. And this is meant to illustrate that this, this blue region is the area of hurricane outflow radially outward and anticyclonic or slightly clockwise. And then we have this strip of orange. This is called a tut tropical upper tropospheric trough. It is also called a PV streamer when it starts to get really thin and stretched out. This is the feature that's going to change some aspects of Hurricane Barrel's environment as it barrels through the Caribbean and moves towards possibly the Greater Antilles, depending on exactly how far north it tracks. How strong it is will probably govern whether it slides up towards Haiti and Jamaica and Cuba or glides toward the south of them. But either way, it's going to be running in to this PV streamer or tut, and that's going to increase the level of vertical shear on the storm. While conditions are quite favorable near the islands, once it gets into the central Caribbean, wind shear values could increase to 20, 25 knots. This is moderate shear. It doesn't guarantee the destruction of the storm, but the storm is small, as we talked about, and therefore more fragile, even to moderate values of shear and its fragility will be a function of how strong it is. The stronger it is, the more resilient it will be, even if it's small. So those things are going to matter, and those are details that are causing a lot of uncertainty in the future. So once we get into the Central and into the Western Caribbean, models disagree a fair bit here on what happens. On the GFS, we see that, okay, mid-960s pressure value as it's crossing over the islands. That's a strong hurricane on this model run. And then as it moves westward, you'll see that pressure value rise a little bit to 980 millibars when it's south of Hispaniola. That's partially due to the land interaction, but also due to the westerly shear starting to impact the vortex. And when you combine the topography with the impact of the shear and interaction with eastern Cuba, it really weakens on the GFS and it's up to 1006 millibars. This might be a tropical depression, very weakened on this model run after going through the gauntlet there. And it barely survives at that point to even continue towards the west. On the European model, we see something similar happen where we have a strong hurricane south of Puerto Rico. And then as it comes west, it starts to weaken a little bit, interacts with Jamaica, and then continues to weaken as the vertical shear starts to impact the storm. And you can see it's in a much weakened state, maybe not even a hurricane by the time it arrives ultimately at the Yucatan Peninsula on the European model. But then some mesoscale models and some ensemble members are showing that there's a chance for the storm to survive a little bit better in the face of the shear. This is the H-Wharf model showing a still very strong hurricane once it gets past the high topography areas of the Greater Antilles and it's able to fight off the vertical shear in that tut a little bit more effectively. This is within the range of outcomes. It's possible. We've seen hurricanes win the war with a tropical upper tropospheric trough before, so it's possible, uh, but in this case, the majority of models are showing some degradation of barrel and showing weakening after it starts trekking through the Central Caribbean. And speaking of track here, this is the GFS ensemble mean showing the mid-level steering flow essentially, and this is when barrel is 
close to or south of the Greater Antilles. This would be Wednesday morning, so middle part of next week. And we talked about how it is going to angle just towards the north a little bit as it moves through the Eastern Caribbean because there's a weaker part of the ridge axis here, but the ridge gets strong and entrenched over the southeastern US. So there's a big area of high pressure here, so that is going to angle the track a little bit more toward the left again at some point here. Therefore, the track isn't going to be doing anything like this. We're not going to see a track up toward the north into the Bahamas or Florida. That's not the kind of track we're destined to see from barrel. What we are going to see is a track generally towards the west or west-northwest into the Western Caribbean, but the details of that start to get pretty murky once we start getting out towards the end of the NHC forecast near Jamaica in five days. It becomes uncertain because a lot of this will depend on how strong is barrel and exactly how close to the Greater Antilles does the storm get. If it's able to maintain hurricane strength, it could track a little bit farther north, and if this ridge eventually weakens, that could change what areas it could impact later. I know most of my audience is pretty U.S.-centered, and so I know I've got a lot of listeners along the southern U.S. wondering where Beryl might go later. And no, we can't guarantee that there won't be a threat from Beryl if this ridge is able to shift towards the east and weaken, and maybe Beryl, if it survives, glides up far enough north to be a threat in the Gulf of Mexico. But it's too early to know that. It just is. A lot of runs do have Beryl weakening and just moving right into Central America. It's very possible that the Yucatan Peninsula is the ultimate destination for this storm. But we can't guarantee anything about this. Uh, really, all we know is we're going to have a strong hurricane moving through the Caribbean and then encountering some challenges. And how much those challenges affect the storm will determine where it goes. So we just have to watch over the next few days and be prepared just in case. This is the GFS Ensemble kind of illustrating what we just talked about, showing strong orange colors indicating a strong hurricane and then weakening down the line. So you can see that's a majority Majority of the members showing significant weakening of barrel due to the vertical shear and or the interaction with the land mass in the Greater Antilles. And then the European model actually shows a stronger hurricane, probably because it's a higher resolution ensemble than the GFS is. So you can see strong hurricane in the Central and Eastern Caribbean, but then you do see the colors start to tail off, but there is a mixture. You see some weak members in blue and green, but you see some members that maintain hurricane intensity in orange or red colors. And so there's quite a range of possible outcomes depending on how resilient Barrel is to the shear and any interaction with Jamaica, Hispaniola, or Cuba. And again, you can see the spread in the possible positions here. Whether it's to the south or the north of this in five days, depends on where it goes next, uh, we'll, or will determine where it goes next. This is the National Hurricane Center official advisory as of 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Saturday. And uh, the Hurricane Center is now seeing the intensification trend of barrel and calling for it to become a major hurricane as it passes through the Windward Islands. So we now have a hurricane warning for Barbados. The track takes it south of them and through the Grenadines just a hair south of St. Vincent. Again, I have to stress that the compact core of destructive wind with barrel, any few miles shift north or south will change which island gets the brunt of the storm. And so if you're in this hurricane watch area from St. Lucia down to Granada, you need to be paying close attention. And in Barbados, and we've even got a tropical storm watch in Tobago, the small shifts of the track will matter a lot here in terms of the wind impact do be preparing you still have time you still have at least a day and a half here before arrival early on monday if you're in barbados and then perhaps a later midday monday if you're in the windward islands uh, to the west of barbados tropical storm watch up to the north as well uh, but that wind field will be limited in size so mostly a rain threat up in the leeward islands this is the wind probability swath showing that everything in orange is essentially a 50-50 shot of seeing 40 mile per hour winds or stronger, so dangerous wind roughly along that corridor. Uh, and again, the most destructive hurricane force wind will be a smaller swath than this. And then of course, rainfall and the potential for flash flooding will be a concern along this corridor, mostly confined to the Windward Islands, but some in the Leeward Islands as well. And then if this does pass close to Hispaniola, tropical storms routinely create massive flooding issues in Hispaniola due to the topography there, which enhances the rainfall. So we'll hope that it passes far enough to the south to spare them that flooding threat. That's about it for this video. I'm going to give you another update tomorrow and we'll continue to watch Barrel as it moves toward the Windward Islands. Get your preparations done, keep each other safe, 
and uh, stay safe this week. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.